So you're finishing up designing your app, but you realize you forgot your navbar and you're all like, shoot, what do I do? So you hop on Dribbble, find the first navbar that works and slap that sucker on there. But other than the obvious color issues, there's a lot wrong with this. So today we're going through nine critical UI elements to upgrade both their UI and UX. And make sure to stick around to the end to find out how to get access to all of these elements entirely for free. So let's start with the mobile tab bar we were just talking about. Of course, it's a very visually appealing interface, but practical and usable, not at all. Let's start with this button that sticks up like a sore thumb. We get it, you want your users to add their content, but most of the time you're using literally all of the other tabs except that one. So let's drop the icon down and get rid of the circle. We'll make sure these icons are all lined up. I'm sure you've already spotted our next problem, the abysmal lack of any contrast. The whole point of using colors is that you can see them. If we bring back the original design, I bet you couldn't even tell that there are in fact different background colors here. Neither could I. Anyways, back to our icons, we already have a fantastic way of telling which is clearly active, so we don't need to make the other icons impossible to see. Speaking of active states, let's revisit this plus icon. If we swap it out for this icon, we can now have an active state for that too. We can also swap this user icon for a profile picture if they upload one. Active states are a good place to play around with your brand colors if you do want to add some pop into your navbar. Now the icon spacing is surprisingly good, but I'm going to shift them out just a bit to increase our click area. We could choose to add some labels down here, and for God's sake make them dark enough to read. The actual Instagram app doesn't have any labels, but apps like Apple Music do. It just depends on how obscure your icons are. Lastly, if we wanted to apply this back onto our original design, we can turn this into a dark mode and even add some transparency and blur if we wanted to get a little fancy. Now for this next one, I'd like you to take a look at this design. Besides the insane amount of elements on the page, which admittedly do look pretty aesthetic, let's focus on this chart and ignore whatever the hell is going on with these smiley faces down here. This chart looks good, but functionally it sucks. If it needs to stay that size and we can't make it any larger, at the very least I'd just add some horizontal grid lines and some markers to give us some clue of the fluctuations. We also need to turn off the curving of these lines. This is a bad trend. It makes it very difficult to tell where the tip of the line actually is. Additionally, the fade out, especially of the most recent data, almost makes it seem like we don't want to know what's going on with our money. If we can scale this up, then I'd move the title and get rid of this button, which I assume takes you to a larger version of the same chart. I'd also add some vertical chart lines so we can get a better sense of the time scale. If we wanted to switch the time frame, we should have that ability too. We can use a drop down if we're short on space, but here we'll lay them out separately. If this wasn't for a stock portfolio, but rather business income, it would be useful to display the last period too. This means that if we're in the month time frame, then the previous month's sales would be represented by this gray line. If you think this is intuitive enough, then you can leave it out, but a legend is often nice to include. Okay, I'm gonna stop throwing shade on Dribble Designs now because next up is UI cards and they do these very well. Instead, we'll be using one of my old designs for this example and God, is it awful. First, I'm gonna swap the text for something better. Let's fix up these margins for the image and the text too. I'm going to drop the size of the paragraph text a bit and switch everything to a more modern font. Rounding off the edges also helps to give everything a more friendly look. Now the CTA is where things get interesting. If you have many cards repeating over and over, you generally don't actually need a CTA, since the entire card will become the link. If you do go this route, you can make it clear that the card is a link by having an arrow icon fade in on hover. Additionally, if you have a specific call to action, like try it out, then you should include the call to action. If you wanted to get extra fancy, start with your image about three quarters the height of the card. We'll then overlay a gradient. This gradient needs to be smooth, so make sure it stretches from the bottom of the image up to about here. The smoother the transition, the better this effect looks. Then just pop your text back on top. I first saw this effect on Apple Music with some select albums. Side by side, you can compare which you like more, but the card on the right will only work with some images and colors, while the card on the left will always work. Next up, pricing cards. Critical if you're building any sort of software as a service, and often done critically wrong. Okay, that's a little dramatic. But anyways, this is our sorta okay design. But of course, we're gonna make it better. First, we're gonna drag this button up here. You might think that throws off the hierarchy a bit, and you'd be correct. We'll fix that by removing the background and just having a stroke on the button. Next, we'll take these bullet points and replace them with check marks. 
and maybe for good measure, we'll add a feature that users don't get with this specific plan. Speaking of the plan, let's give it a name so it's easier to identify, and a little description too. You're probably like, wow, that's an original name. And I'm just gonna say, I never said I was a good copywriter, just an okay designer. Let's then add this cursed message down here, so our users don't think we're bad people when they find out it's actually $20 a month. This is really good, but I wanna separate the numbers from the features like Hostinger does. We could use a literal divider, but instead I'm gonna grab a reduced opacity version of our primary color for the background. Finally, I'll change the call to action to something a little more actionable, and now it's looking lovely. Which one do you like more? Up next, stickers. Now these aren't the most used UI element, but I have recently found myself using them more on certain designs since they're useful to break out of boxy layouts and can add information. To make one of these, grab the star tool and add 12 points to it. Then we can drag out the ratio and round the corners. Now for these kind of stickers, I like to use quirky display fonts like Gord Quick or Barracito, but you can play around with those. On some of the stickers, it's nice to have an outline for some extra detail or even some circular text. The plugin I use to create this text is called Two Path. We can even add some depth with the drop shadow that's a darker color than our sticker and is at full opacity and is offset a bit. These kind of elements are definitely where you should try and get very creative. Try out different shapes, colors, and patterns. You could even give your button the kaleidoscope effect, which works very well on dark UI themes. If you want to learn how to make this kaleidoscope effect, check out this video next. Moving on to an element where you have a lot less freedom, sign up modals. Done well on Dribbble, but not done so well by beginners, since there is a lot going on. Believe it or not, this sign-up modal is in fact awful, even though it doesn't look terrible. The first thing is the labels as the empty states in the inputs. What if you get halfway through typing and forget what you're typing? We'll take those labels and move them up above the inputs where they're always visible. Next, filling in those inputs with real empty states allows the user to see an example before they enter their information. Then let's add a subheading of create account so it's clear that this is a sign up and not a login. Speaking of logging in, what if that's what you want to do? Let's add this little button so people can easily navigate to log in. This feels a little cramped with the labels, so let's add some space. For sign up or login modals, I always stick to a four pixel grid religiously. The UX of this is pretty good, but I want to modify the input field to make it look a little nicer. Let's add an off white background and reduce the stroke to a 40% opacity. And now that is looking fantastic. This can also be modified to add more inputs or repurposed for a login modal instead. Next, we're going all the way to the bottom of the website to talk about footers. You might not give these much thought, which is probably why they look bad. I think designers scroll around on some industry standard sites like Apple or Linear and figure out that they should lay out their footer the same way. The only problem is that your website probably doesn't have 23 goddamn links, and so therefore probably shouldn't have a footer that looks like this. Let's make something that looks simple and elegant. I'm gonna assume you have somewhere between three to five links, which is a pretty normal amount. We'll center those and put my awful logo above the links. Pop any socials you have below in the center. We'll put our copyright message on the left and the credits of the design, probably to you, on the right. This way we keep things simple and don't need to have five different columns for links. If you do require more than the five-ish links that you can fit in here, then you will need to consider a different layout. But I imagine that many of the websites you're making don't require these giant ass footers that look awful when you only have like six links in them. Handy enough, this footer also looks great in dark mode too. Okay, onto one of my favorite design elements and food groups, chips. As you can tell from my recent designs, I like using them. They're practical for a breadcrumb navigation, like on the Lindier landing page. And they lend themselves to adding some interaction to an experience. Now you're probably like, Psh, honestly, how hard could this be? You take a background, slap some text on there, and call it a day. But be careful, make the background too small, and it looks stupid. Make the background too large, and you've created a button. The difference between chips and actual buttons is chips almost never have the primary CTA as their color and are always thinner vertically. Whenever you're dealing with a chip, always use auto layout. Here's how. Write out whatever you want the chip to say. Then hit Shift A on your keyboard, which automatically creates an auto layout frame. Add a background and round the edges. Then you can adjust the padding. I like setting the vertical padding to be either a half or a quarter of the horizontal padding. 
This means if you set 20 pixels of padding here, this can either be 10 pixels or five. On to our last element. Last, but certainly not least, we'll be updating this old carousel design. It looks fine here, but change this image and all of a sudden you can't see shit. Anyways, let's start by adding some navigation so we can tell how many photos there are. Let's be fancy again and put it on a dark background with some blur, but you could also put this below the image too. We'll then take our arrows from up here and move them down beside our navigation. Now, if you wanted to get extra fancy, we could extend this circle out and turn it into a timer for the image. Pretty cool, hey? This works on desktop, of course, and on mobile, just like this. If you do want free access to any of these elements, it'll be the first link in the description down below. And there you go, nine elements fully upgraded to both their UI and UX. If you're able to put up with me for this long, consider subscribing. But other than that, I'll see you in the next video.